All right, let's just continue. Um, like tonight, really the sermon is going to be mainly about the office of a bishop, just because I'm, I'm going to be finishing up the two points on this house church movement. And really, uh, the two ones I'm going to be finishing on is this idea that every church must have multiple elders. And, and it, it's, it's sort of ludicrous, if you, even if you think about it, that they say, hey, you know, every church must have multiple elders. They don't even consider, well, are, you know, are there even multiple people qualified? You know, uh, can you even afford uh, multiple elders? So it is correct, though, that in Acts, when you read about elders, they're always referring to multiple elders. But you've got to think as well, when we read the book of Acts, we're reading a time where Christianity is booming. You know, there are miracles happening. The apostles are alive and well. There are things happening. You know, we think about the day of Pentecost where 3,000 people were added to the church. Uh, you know, and, and, and there was great fear. Remember when Anani um, Ananias and Sapphira, they tried to lie about how much they gave to church. And then they were killed because they were lying about it. So there was a great fear that was come on the people. And, and a lot of things were happening there. So... I don't know if necessarily in every country, in every place, we can say, well, it should be like the book of Acts, because obviously, even when the apostles went out, when Paul went out to preach the gospel, you had to start somewhere, right? You had to start um, with one and, and grow <coughs> from there. So I, I wanted to show you one verse, though, uh, in Acts 14.23. This is one of the passages where the term elder is always used in the plural. It says here, And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Now, somebody might say, well, in that verse, well, they ordained multiple elders in these multiple churches. Or did they just ordain maybe one church in one elder in one church, two elders in another church? We don't know, right? So it could be possible that there were some churches where only one person was qualified in order to um, oversee that church and they only, only ordained uh, one elder. I wouldn't rule out that possibility. So, <coughs> but you've got to ask the question, you know, let's say they went to all these churches to ordain elders, but only one person was qualified. Would they ordain somebody that wasn't qualified just so that they could have multiple elders? So. I think sometimes people set this rule, but um, I, don't, I think in practicality, it's not even always able to be followed. <clears throat> Let's go to Titus 1. And um, I just feel like this verse in Titus 1, 5, just, it just so many things sort of um, uh, rely on this passage because it's, I think it's one that's quite telling. But um, it says here, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Now, we could assume that, hey, maybe there were other elders already in Crete, but then I guess the question is, well, why then did Paul need to leave Titus there? You know, there were already elders in Crete. Why didn't he leave Titus somewhere else where there wasn't already elders? And he says here, for this cause left I thee in Crete. So thee is a singular term. He left Titus there alone in order to set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city. So this idea, hey, ideally, a church that is thriving and has hundreds and hundreds of people and you're able to afford um, multiple people to take up the office of a bishop, it would make sense to have multiple, to share the workload. Because obviously, like Moses, you know, if one person does all the work in, uh, uh, or all the overseeing, he's going to burn himself out. So, you know, he had captains over hundreds and captains over th um, thousands in order to help him uh, lead that flock. So... The idea here that Titus was left here alone in Crete in order to set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city. My point here is, I mean, if you're going to start somewhere, I mean, you have to start with one. You know, you start with one and then you get two and then you start growing as the need arises. Um, <clears throat> so you've got to think as well, you know, if you just force multiple elders just for the sake of having multiple elders, are there even multiple men qualified to have multiple. I mean, let's look at the uh, qualifications here that are required in order to take up the office of a bishop. Um, we'll just read it first and then I'll go through it a bit one by one. It says here, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, 
For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So let's just go through this with a fine tooth comb and then we'll compare it with 1 Timothy 3. Get a drink. <coughs> now, not everyone in this room may one day want to be a bishop. You know, some people, I know some of you are, but not everybody uh, might think, you know, hey, I'm not striving to be a bishop. I'm fine just being a follower. You know, I'm not even married, whatever. But <coughs> just because you don't desire the office of a bishop doesn't mean you shouldn't take heed to tonight's sermon because. Just because there are qualifications for a bishop, that doesn't mean that God only expects this standard for bishops. I mean, you have to uphold this standard in order to be a bishop and for somebody to recognize you as being qualified. But obviously what God expects of the person leading his church is the same that he expects from all men of God because he wants everyone to live to a perfect standard. So don't think, hey, just because I don't desire the office of a bishop, I don't need to live to this standard. That's just for Victor and, and other people that desire this office. No, you have to strive to live to the same standard um, <clears throat> if you want to please God and, and do the right thing. So verse 6 says here, if any be blameless now one thing i just want to focus on there is it says if any so there's not this idea that you know god calls people into the ministry you get this special call of god you know i always wondered what that call was you know could i could i i mean i couldn't say that it wasn't god because you know i'm not going to limit god that god could not um speak to somebody somebody god could not give somebody a vision god could not give somebody a dream or a direction i'm not going to limit him in that sense i think a lot of the dreams and visions that we hear about about are bogus and maybe you know satanic in some sense but i'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. i don't think god is limited he can he, he spoke in dreams and visions before there's no reason why he can't do it today i definitely would be on the side of skepticism because the reason why god gave dreams and visions is to share his word and if we have his word complete as I believe today, what need would there be for dreams and visions? But hey, I'm not uh, dogmatic about that <clears throat> ceasing. I'm not a cessationalist, somebody that believes all gifts and, and all these things have ceased. <clears throat> but it says here, if any be blameless. So that, you know, and in, in 1 Timothy it says, if, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire the good work. So it, it starts with a desire. It starts with somebody willing to heed the call. You know, so it's not just you get this call of God. And I always wonder how people would determine how, whether they even knew that that was God and not just their emotion. How do you, how do you determine that thing that you felt in that, in that special emotional uh, church service that you attended where you gave your life to the Lord, you came down to the altar and you, you were called to preach? Because how many people have been called to preach and where are they now? You know, it was just some experience they had at a youth camp. See, they're not thinking about these things soberly. They're not thinking, what does it actually take to be a bishop? What things do I need to do? Or what are the responsibilities I need to do? They're not even married yet. They don't even have children yet. And they want to lead the church of God just because they had this emotional feeling. They think that they were called. Um, so I don't think it comes down to this emotion. I don't think it comes down to this experience you had. Hey, God is saying, if any... Anyone that fulfills the qualifications and desires the office of a bishop can go for that role uh, if the need arises and they get to this point in their life. So if any, so anybody can, can take up that office if they have the desire and they meet these qualifications and it is recognized by the existing um, elders, existing bishop. <clears throat> Now, it says here, if any be blameless. Now, blameless is not sinless. Because obviously, if you had to be sinless to be a bishop, then nobody would be, there would, there would be nobody that would be a bishop because we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So what does blameless mean? Blameless means that you can't be accused of wrongdoing. Now, obviously, a lot of people, you know, if you have enemies, are going to try and accuse you of doing things that are wrong. But as a general rule... <coughs> You shouldn't have things in your life where people can just accuse you of blatant wrongdoing. 
Um, so that's what it means to be blameless. The husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Now we see here, first of all, it says the husband of one wife, not the wife of one husband. So to be a bishop, it's only an office for men. It is not an office for women. So these women that are walking around pretending to be bishops, pretending to be pastors, they're just blatant going against uh, the word of God here. And sometimes you'll see in Pentecostal churches where they'll, they'll mention the, 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 the bishop and his wife and they'll call him like, you know, Pastor Victor and Pastor Elizabeth. Now Elizabeth's not a pastor, all right? She's not a bishop. She's the bishop's wife um, because she's not the husband of one wife. She's the wife of one husband. So these Pentecostals that are calling their wife Pastor so-and-so um, need to read Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3 again um, just realize who is the bishop. Or maybe, maybe that's just an accurate representation of their life. Maybe they just share 50-50 and they're both in charge at home. Maybe that's why they both share the leadership at church. I don't know. Um, so the husband of one wife has to be a man. He has to be married. He has to be the husband of one wife. So these, these single guys that are you know, uh, um, um, graduating from Bible college and pastoring churches they shouldn't be doing that because they're not married. They're single. They need to get married and they need to have children and their children need to be under control. <coughs> um, now, one thing I just want to mention here on the husband and one wife, uh, oftentimes I've heard that means that a bishop can't be divorced. Now, I don't agree with that because I believe if you are lawfully divorced, they're no longer your wife anymore. So it's not saying here that the, the man is not divorced. It's just saying here that he's the husband of one wife because as you guys may be shocked by this, but there are people out here that have multiple wives, even though you know, they may you know, go to the government and get a bill of divorcement. If they didn't do it lawfully, if they didn't do it for the cause of fornication, if it was just irreconcilable differences and they've you know, supposedly put this woman away, but she hasn't gotten married and, and fornicated and, and it's actually been dissolved lawfully, they're just married to multiple people. So... <clears throat> You know, if somebody says they're divorced, I mean, it depends how they divorced. You know, did they divorce lawfully? But if they did divorce lawfully, you know, it's something they did wrong that was in the past and now they're only married to one person, I think that doesn't disqualify them from the ministry. So, because they're only married to one person. They're not uh, married to multiple people, which is what this is against. If you're a bishop of a church, you're not meant to have multiple wives which a lot of people did have in the Bible. So the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. So I do believe in order to be qualified as a bishop, you need to have children. You can't be ordained as a bishop if you don't have children at all. And some people might say, well, what about people that can't have children? You know, they really want to, um, you know, uh, take up that office of a bishop, but they've been trying for years and years and years and years and they don't have a child. Are they not allowed to take up the office of a bishop? No, because having, having faithful children. So it's, it's pretty clear, you gotta, you know, you gotta have children to have faithful children, not accused of unright or unruly. So you can't have no children and take up the, you shouldn't be taking up the office of a bishop if you don't have children. Now the reason why this is so important is because it takes a lot of responsibility. It takes a bit of character to actually raise a family. Um, you know, that's one thing I definitely realized when, you know, when I started having children is, hey, it was, first of all, it was really easy being single, right? Because you don't have to take care of anybody. So yeah, I suppose you can be a really effective um, coordinator in a church if you're not married at all, because, you know, like the, the Orthodox Church, and I'll get into that in a second, you know, they're just talking about, oh, you know, if you get married and you don't have time to go and take care of the church. Um, but that, this is not what God's idea is. <coughs> so, you know, and even once you get married before you have children, hey, that's really easy as well. Man, when, when my wife and I were married and we didn't have any children, man, life was so easy, had so much time. You know, you, you hang out with friends, get home at 11 o'clock or whatever, and then just, you know, just wash up, go to bed, nothing. But it's not like that when you have children. You know, children, it, it really, to me, when you have children, it really tests 
whether or not you know what you're doing as a husband and as a father. Because when you have children, you know, you're tired, there are stresses, you have to work as a team in order to keep your family in order. And this is why it's so important that the bishop is the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of right or unruly, because it really, truly is the proving ground for whether he can take the rigorous activity which is dealing with the church of God. Um, and, you know, I don't think any of us do it perfectly. Um, I'm not saying that I'm a perfect husband or a perfect father, but that really shows what sort of man you are um, if you can get your wife and children in order. I mean, if you can't even get your wife to respect you and to follow you, what makes you think you're going to get other people to respect you and to follow you? Unless you're a phony, unless you don't get to know the people, you're a fake, you know, you're at church and you're pretending to be one person, you know, you're this, this great... Uh, um, you know, high up, holy person at church, but then at home, your wife doesn't respect you, your children don't respect you. Um, it, yeah, if you're a phony, that'll happen. But if you actually share your life with people, um, when they see how you deal with your family, how you deal with your wife, um, that'll help you earn respect with the people in your church. So it says here, for a bishop must be blameless, <coughs> for a bishop... <coughs> must be blameless as the steward of God. So we see here that the bishop is a steward of God. So <coughs> he's responsible for the physical possessions of the church. Now he's not the only steward of God because all of us have some level of stewardship because God has uh, you know, given us talents, he's given us abilities, he's given us resources, and one day we will be judged how we used those resources, how we used those abilities to further the kingdom of God. So we have our own physical possessions that we um, you know, have received and we're stewards of and how are we going to use them for God. But the bishop is a steward of God in the church because he decides how the resources are going to be spent, how things are going to be done. Um, and this is why it's very important that he's a good steward of God. Um, it says here, not self-willed. So this is important too, just on the topic of being a steward of God, that you're doing what's best, number one, by God, and you're doing what's best by the flock. Because a bishop that is self-willed is going to do things that are in his best interest rather than in the best interest of the church and to God. Um, now, that doesn't mean that necessarily things are not done his way, because obviously, you know, he's got to decide how things are going to be done, but it means that he's taking those things into account when he just makes decisions. Not soon angry. So somebody that uh, it does not get angry very easily. Somebody that is patient. Because there are going to be people that are going to be opposing you. And there are going to be people that maybe ask you the same question again and again and again. Multiple people asking the same question again and again and again. And if somebody says, you know, why do you keep asking me these things? Well, it's because, you know, you're a bishop. That's, that's the point of your job is you're meant to be feeding the flock, you're meant to be answering these questions. So you need to be patient with people and be willing to explain the same things again and again and again to different people. And you don't want to be soon angry, especially when you're talking to people that may be adverse to you um, and, and try and get under your skin. Um, God wants somebody that is patient and long-suffering. Uh, not given to wine. Now, this is a given. You know, obviously, you don't want a bishop that is a drunkard and a, and a loser and a, and a sluggard. But it also comes to being, <coughs> it also talks to somebody that has self-control, right? Discipline. You know, somebody who's not given over just to the, the food and the lusts of the flesh, I think it also alludes to. Now, no striker. That means somebody that's not quick to get into fights. Um, and well, not somebody, somebody's not, not quick to get into fights. You shouldn't be getting into fights at all. You know, no striker. Um, but that's why it's very important that you're not a striker and you're not soon angry because when you put those two together, you get people that um, get into fights very easily. And we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So our war in this world is not a physical war. We, we're not called to take up arms and try and take over a nation, establish a Christian nation. Hey, if we can do that peacefully with the words of our mouth, hey, that'd be great. 
be great to have a nation that actually upheld the laws of God, you know, put homosexuals to death, put adulterers to death, put murderers to death. Hey, it'd be a great place to live. I'd love to live in a country like that. Um, but we live in a world where, you know, God's word is not supreme. But hey, that doesn't mean we can't influence it, right? That's why I do encourage people to get involved um, politically, at least know who you're voting for and know how to vote and, and make your vote count. Don't just go in, you know, sign your name off so you don't get fined and then put it in the box. To me, it's, it's kind of a waste, you know? Don't complain when somebody you don't like uh, wins office. <coughs> if you didn't have your say when you had the chance. Um, let's see, so no striker. So we're talking about physical fighting here. Uh, not given to filthy lucre. So not somebody that is greedy or materialistic or somebody even that is not wise with their finances. Why? Because as a bishop, you're the steward of God. You're going to be taking care sometimes of very, very large amounts of money. If you are a bishop of a church that has hundreds and hundreds of people and these people are giving to the work, that's a, that's a lot of money. I mean, even our church. I think our last, because um, I had to, for public liability insurance, um, we, had to, we had to get public liability insurance to, um, to cover a hole. And um, we pay like, uh, I, I told you guys it was going to be like 100 bucks a week, but it ended up only being like 16 or 17 dollars a week, thank God. So I just got like the minimum level of cover just so I could show them, hey, we've got public liability insurance so that we can hire the hall and there's no problem. So anyways, with public liability insurance, we have to tell them, you know, how much our, our, our approximate annual revenue is. And I think the last 12 months, it was like $60,000. Now, we're not a big group. And, you know, like I said, I'm not complaining about the giving here. You guys give as much as you believe you should give. Um, but I'm just saying, even with a small a group this small, I mean, that's a lot of money, right? I mean, that's, that's a lot of money on top of even my, my salary at work of, of what to do with that money. So I think it's very important that it's somebody that's not given to filthy lucre. He's not just in it for the money because it's going to be very easy to be in it for the money when you have a large church and a lot of money is coming in. It needs to be somebody that is not materialistic, doesn't care about money uh, in terms of how much wealth he's going to amass. All right, verse 8 says here, but a lover of hospitality. Now, I always joke when I read this one, oh man, that one's easy. I love hospitality. You know, I, I, could, I could enjoy hospitality all, all my life. But that's obviously not what this is saying. It's not saying that you love hospitality. It means you love to be hospitable. It's something that comes natural to you. Uh, 1 Timothy 3 says you're given to hospitality. So it, it's not just something that comes natural, but you, you love doing it. You love having people over. Um, and, you know, I think this is very important as a bishop because you need to share your life with the people that are part of your church. This is why I've, I've had, I, I don't do this as often as I have just because I've been getting really busy. But, um, you know, I like to have you guys over and I, you know, that's why I like having things in my house. You know, like on Saturday I told you guys I'm having a bonfire. Um, you know, I know I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, didn't have good reason not to be there. But, you know, this is why I, I have things like that. I don't mind people coming over to my house. I want you to come over. I want you to hang out. I want you to see where I live, how I live. Ask me questions. Get to know me. I want to give you these opportunities because I don't always have the opportunity to go to everyone's house, invite everyone over. So I, sometimes I'll just have something at my place. Oh, we'll have a dinner together or whatever. You know, that, that's your chance to get to know me, to get to know other people um, and for me to share my life with you. And this is really important because we know something that always, well not always, but we know something that happens a lot in churches is that the bishop or the elders become disconnected from the flock. You might see that a lot. And even when there are multiple elders, you know, they hang around with each other and they, they're like in their ivory tower. They don't really get to know other people. And this is why it's very important that a bishop is a lover of hospitality, is given to hospitality, because what happens is that promotes genuineness. It promotes accountability. It means that, you know, because I should not just be accountable to some other bishop somewhere else that doesn't even know, you know, like some bishops think that they're only accountable to other bishops. No, like I should be accountable to you as well. So you guys keep me accountable. I keep you accountable. We all keep each other accountable. Just because I make the decisions in this church doesn't mean you're just only accountable to me like it's a one-way street. You guys are there to keep me accountable as well and this is the importance of sharing your life with the people in church. A lover of hospitality, 
a lover of good men. So you see, he loves people that are trying to do the right thing, not just a lover of powerful men, not just a lover of rich men, you know, like sometimes bishops, they only hang around with the deacons that are giving and giving. They're the people they hang around with. They're the people they love. They're the people they honor. No, you don't just honor people that give. You don't just honor people that have a position. You honor good men. You're a lover of people that are good um, and striving to do what is right. Because obviously there's none righteous, no, not one. But we're talking about people that are striving to walk in the spirit. Now, sober is not just talking about the opposite of not given to wine. So not given to wine is somebody that's not a drunkard. But sober means that you're, you're clear-headed because you're going to be making some very serious decisions as a bishop. Decisions that are going to be affecting people, affecting people's spiritual life um, and things like that. So you need to make these decisions clear-headed and um, um, <coughs> you need to be able to think clearly. And this sort of ties in with not being soon angry, um, you know, being quick to hear, remember, slow to speak, um, and not emotionally driven. This is one reason why women uh, are not really wired to be a leader, because women generally are more emotionally driven. They, they, they act on their emotions and they get angry a lot easier. I'm, I'm just generalizing. But even the Bible generalizes. That's why it says Adam... Adam um, the woman was in, uh, the man was in transgression. He wasn't deceived. I'm not quoting it right, but um, uh, saying that um, uh, the woman being in the transgression was deceived and not the man. Um, and that's why I believe men should be in charge in the local, test, uh, local New Testament church because they're just not as easily swayed and de deceived and not as easily uh, led by their emotions. <coughs> All right, so sober. Let's look at um, just. So what does just mean? Just means that you're fair because sometimes you will need to make decisions between believers where there might be a dispute in the church and you need to make a judgment and say, hey, this person's right, this person isn't right. You need to be fair and just and make judgments that are based on righteousness and not just you know, who you love better um, and who you, who you think um, you like better. So a lover of good men, sober, just, you're holy, which means you're, you should be separate from the worldliness and the lusts of this world. And then you're temperate. So temperate means you're disciplined and you're consistent because that's very important as a bishop to be consistent and disciplined because you're the one that needs to make sure things are running and that you're doing things correctly. You know, as a, as a church member, sometimes you might think, oh, you know, I don't feel like going to church today, so I'm just not going to go. Well, you can't do that as a bishop, because if you don't go, I mean, who's going to run the thing, you know, and um, things like that. So you need to be consistent, you need to be disciplined, because Christianity and the church keeps going even when you don't feel like it. So it's about being um, constant, in, instant, in season, and out of season. And it's to make sure that you keep up that example as well. Because you need to set an example to the flock. Hey, even when things are easy, hey, when things are easy and things, everything's going your way, it's easy to do the right thing. But are you going to do the right thing when things are hard? You know, maybe your marriage at that point in time is not going so well. You know, does that mean you stop going soul winning? You stop doing the right thing? You, know, you might having a struggle in your family. You got to learn to keep on going and be consistent and temperate in the bad times and in the good. You need to make sure you're always doing what God wants you to do. <clears throat> but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So it says here, it's not just holding fast what he's taught. You know, he's, he, he's holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught. And he's not just holding fast any word, right? Because some preachers get up and they're like, oh, I'm holding fast to the Bible and they're preaching out of some NIV or they're preaching out of the New King James Version. They're not even awake enough to realize there are differences between these Bibles. They can't all be the word of God. Something is corrupted. Um, and this is why we hold to the King James Bible because we believe the King James Bible has not been corrupted. There are no contradiction, contradictions. And this is why we're holding fast to the faithful word not just anything we call the word so he's holding fast the faithful word he's standing firm as he hath 
been taught. So it shows here that the bishop is still somebody that is teachable. You know, he's somebody that can learn, um, that can be corrected. That somebody that is, it doesn't believe he just knows everything, that he's still learning along with the flock, um, as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine. So it's very important that he has sound doctrine. It's not just holding fast positions with un, holding fast doctrines with unsound positions. You know, so he's holding fast the faithful word he's being taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers so you exhort and convince gainsayers by sound doctrine not just doctrine because everyone's got doctrine right and then you have all these bishops that are holding fast to their doctrines but the question is are they holding fast to sound doctrine meaning their doctrine actually holds water it can be tested it can explain things it answers all the different verses that seem to contradict it therefore it's a sound doctrine it's a sound position because all too often and you know this happens in a lot of churches hey and uh, the catholic church and the orthodox church is a great example of this where tradition starts to trump sound doctrine and they are holding fast to doctrine they're holding fast to the doctrines that have been passed down but are they holding fast the faithful word are they holding fast the faithful word with sound doctrine um, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now, is exhorting and convincing the gainsayers two different things, or are they the same thing? You know, is there is there is there one type of? Uh, I just you know, this is what I think when I read these things. I'm like, okay, he's got to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So is that like one thing? Like to exhort the believers is one thing, and then to convince the gainsayers is another thing, or is it just the same thing? Meaning, when you hold fast the faithful word as you've been taught and you speak sound doctrine, you don't only exhort the believers, but you also are going to convince the gainsayers, which shows this is why doctrine needs to be sound, because a gainsayer is not going to be convinced if you're just preaching assumptions and preaching things that you've always believed but cannot defend, um, cannot talk about sound doctrine. <clears throat> now let's just quickly compare this to 1 Timothy 3. <coughs> And we'll just read through it and I'll just sort of cover some things as we go. So it says, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. So we already talked about, hey, it starts with a desire. Any man can take up this office um, and it's a good work. So number one, it's something that, that ought to be desired. And number two, it's work. So it's not just a position that you take up just for reputation's sake. Um, you know, the, the, Jesus talks about the greatest of us shall be servant of all. And, and this is why, you know, I try and work as hard as I can. I try and get things going here. I try and be an example to you guys because that's my job as a bishop. It's not just to be this guy, you know, you guys do all the work and I just come in and I preach my sermon and I go, you guys all clean up. I try and help, try and get things ready, you know, try and get things in order because I should be working as hard, even not, if not harder than you guys to get these things going in the church. So it's a work, it's something that we have to uh, do. Uh, bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behaviour, given to hospitality, apt to teach. <clears throat> so we can see here the same sort of qualifications. Apt to teach, so the ability to be able to explain things to people simply so that they can understand. Not given to wine, so we see there the, the, the not <coughs> given to wine as well in Titus 1. No striker, not greedy of filthy lucre. It said given to filthy lucre in the other. But patient. So he said, saw before, not soon angry, right? Patient. Not a brawler. So no striker. Not covetous. Again, that, that greediness of filthy lucre. Uh, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now this is something we, it's funny because Peter was there, but well, this is something that I brought up to the Orthodox priest because we, we had one meeting with him and we could have talked about a multitude of things. I wanted to just hit him on a couple of things that I thought were really, really obvious. And the fact that they believe bishops should, should be celibate and the Bible clearly states here that a bishop um, needs to be married and have children. So we, we asked what their reasoning was and, and basically his answer was he didn't really 
his answer was basically, well, a synod sometime in like 1000 AD or whatever decided that it was too hard for a bishop to be able to take care of his family and take care of the Church of God. So they decided it was better for them not to be married rather than take up all their time being married and having children. And I was saying to him, well, isn't that, well, but why then in the Bible, I mean, the, the God is giving us the reason why a bishop should be married and have children. Because it says here, for a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So the intention behind a bishop being married is that's the testing ground, that's the proving ground to show, can you even take care of a wife? Can you take care of children? And if you can, then you're qualified to take care of the church of God. Whereas they've got it totally the opposite way around now, saying, well, you know, I don't have time to take care of my family and, and, a, and a wife, but then yet I'm still qualified to be the bishop of a huge, I don't know what they call it, diocese or whatever. So I thought that was interesting that somehow, you know, we asked, well, how did they come to that decision? And they were saying, you know, they had this, this synod, which is like a group of all the bishops and, and all their leaders. And, you know, they pray that the Holy Spirit will give them leading. But then we were thinking, well, why is the Holy Spirit giving you different direction to the direction he gave these guys? I mean, what has, what has changed? Like, why would the Holy Spirit say one thing to, uh, through Paul to Timothy and then say something else to your synod? Um, I mean, what has changed? But you know, one thing that was really funny, I gotta tell you guys this. Um, one thing that was really funny about that meeting, somehow we got into the, the communion, right? And you know, they believe in transubstantiation. <laughs> Peter's already laughed. They believe in transubstantiation. So he says, he, he goes, you know, I have got bread that has literally turned into the body of Jesus. Uh, in, in the building. And, and I'm like, well, can I, can I see this bread? You know, because I've never seen this transubstantiated bread. And, you know, I'm thinking, you know, like these loaves of bread that have been cut up nicely, they've been blessed, and they're maybe like in this glass box that they worship, right? And, and it's all there. It's like, you know, bread that you would probably eat, but then it hasn't gone moldy. Because he's saying, because this hasn't gone moldy in three years. He, and it's, this is the miracle. This is how they prove um, transubstantiation because they say hey this bread has not gone moldy for three years so I've got these high hopes right we're going into this place and we walk into the building and it's all it's all lovely and you know all we've got these idols and pictures around um, and then he goes behind he comes from the back and it's like this sort of altar area and you know you're not meant to go onto the first step and he opens his doors and he's saying what he does and he pulls out this little gold box and I literally, because I, I, I didn't realize that, that the bread that he was talking about was in that box because he was just holding it sort of lax, lackadaisically talking about it. And to me, if that's, if that's the literal body of Jesus, I would probably treat it with a bit more respect and you know, have it like cased somewhere that people can't touch. You just can't just grab it and show people. Because we were joking later that if he showed us, like what if somebody sneezed on it or something like that? <laughs> you know, and all that bread's gone. Like it's in my hair and stuff like that. So anyways, he shows me this, and the box is literally like this big. It's like, you know, probably about, you know, the size of my phone, but like a box, right? And it's painted gold. And I look inside the box to see, like, well, what is this bread that has become the body of Jesus? And literally, I kid you not, it just looked like the crumbs that are at the bottom of like a crout, like you buy some croutons. And it's like the crumbs at the bottom. They're not, even, they're not even cut into the size of croutons. Like, you know, you'd think like you'd get a square that's like a crouton. But this was like little, literally crumbs, like the leftovers that haven't been dried. And you know my first thought when I look at it? I'm just thinking, well, of course it hasn't gone moldy because it's dry. I mean, it's dry bread that's gone stale and dried. It looks like it was toasted. I mean, do you know, do you know what it takes for mold to grow on bread? It requires moisture. It requires moisture in the bread. It requires mold spores. And in a nice climate-controlled, air-conditioned, Greek Orthodox church building, you're not, you're not going to get that, right? It's, it's probably all dried out and therefore it doesn't go moldy. You know, when Anastasia and I, I was just thinking before, Anastasia and I, she came to help clear out that storeroom. I don't know if you remember, there was a piece of pizza that was in that storeroom. Hey, that, I don't know how long that piece of pizza's been there. But there wasn't any mold on that piece of pizza. Does that mean that's the body of Christ? So, you know, just, and this, to me, it just reminds me of like these scammers. You know, like these scammers in like third world countries, they come and they've got their feathers and they're like, ooh, and they do all these tricks. And it's just like people that are just ignorant of, how, of science and they think, oh, like this bread that didn't go moldy, that's the body of Jesus. And one thing that was really funny, he was saying, well, how do you explain 
the other half going mouldy and, and this not going mouldy. Um, and we're like, well, where's the other half? Because he had just finished explaining to us after they break the, you know, the bread for the Holy Communion, they don't waste the bread. They give it out and everyone eats it. So how did you even know? And maybe if you left the other half, that wouldn't have gone mouldy as well. And the, and, uh, I don't know, Peter's laughing. About it. But you know the, bomb, the bombshell thing that was so funny because he was going on about how this bread doesn't go mouldy, right? And then Andrula, Peter's sister, says, can I just ask you something? They did this test on this McDonald's burger and fries and it didn't go mouldy for three years. And he's like, it didn't go mouldy? He's like, what about after that? And they're like, no, it didn't go mouldy for like 15 years. And he's just like, oh, okay. Like, to me, it's just like, yeah, it was just funny because it just sort of st stoked him. But, and then what I did, because I figured, you know, I wonder what they actually put in this bread because maybe that explains why it won't go mouldy. Um, so I looked up, maybe you guys know this as Greeks, but I looked up what bread they actually use for um, the Orthodox Holy Communion. And it's a bread that they call um, prosphora. So prosphora is the, the, the bread that they call it, the bread that they make. And it's basically like this two-layered biscuit that they bake and they stamp a seal on the top. So they stamp the seal and that seal has, a, you know, represents Mary and the Holy Spirit and all these sorts of things. So there's a certain seal that they stamp on the top. Um, so what happens when people bake it? I looked up the ingredients. Now normally when you make bread, you have the flour, you have the water, the salt, the yeast, and then you normally add some oil, right? Because the oil is what makes your, your bread kind of um, like moist. It's for those of you who bake cakes, if you don't put enough butter or oil, the cake is really dry, isn't it? Because it doesn't retain the moisture. Well, guess what, how they make prosphora? They don't put oil in prosphora, or the recipe I looked at anyway. Is that right? Do you guys know how to make prosphora? I don't know. Okay, you guys aren't Greek Orthodox enough. <laughs> so, um, so they make this prospera, and, it's, and the recipe that I looked up, it was just on this Greek Orthodox recipe site, and it was flour, water, salt, and yeast, and nothing else. So it's just this plain biscuit. Now Elizabeth knows, because Elizabeth sometimes makes flour tortillas. If you don't put oil in them, they get dry really, really quick, and then they just become like a cracker. If you guys remember one time we had, um, the, Lord, uh, the, the breaking of bread at my place, and it was bread that Elizabeth made. And remember, it was like really dry. It was like really hard to chew. I'm sure that bread would not have grown mold either. Maybe we, and, and, and <clears throat> so my point is, they make this bread, they toast it, right? So it's literally like, uh, it kind of looks like a flattened out muffin. They put the two loaves that they've cooked together, they stamp the top, and then what happens when the priest blesses it, he takes off the top bit, just the top bit, and that's what's used for communion. And the rest they divvy up as the antidoron, which is the, you know, they just give it to people that aren't like ready for, for Holy Communion, but it's just a blessing for them to be able to eat that bread, but it's not the actual body of Jesus. So then I think, number one, this bread doesn't have oil. You know, number two, it's cut into very little pieces for everyone to get a little bit. You know, it's in an air-conditioned building, so it's drying out, and it's the top of the bread, meaning that's the bit that's baked, it's the outside, right? It's not not using the necessarily the larger portion which is the bottom side so to me it's not really it's uh, you know to, to, to claim that it's the body of Jesus just because it doesn't have mold to me it's like a bit of a scam to me um, and one thing my wife and I are going to try and do maybe we'll just, just try and make it and just see if it doesn't go moldy and then we'll go like well we've got bread that didn't go moldy either so you know it's funny right he's saying like oh he's he's like it didn't go moldy the other half went moldy because the greek orthodox faith it's a mystery you can't explain it you know he's talking about it like it's god like you can't comprehend the greek orthodox faith it's just too above everyone um and we're like well we can't we just explain it to you you know there's no moisture there's no more that's why it didn't go moldy mcdonald's doesn't go moldy um you know it's, it's not really that that crazy <clears throat> Okay, so husband of one wife, uh, where'd you go? not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the cond condemnation of the devil. So not a beginner. Otherwise, it's really easy to be puffed up with pride. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So there are two ways you could take that verse. You know, I take it as, you know, you should get to know people that are also um, don't have a lot of money. Um, one thing you could take that as well to say, hey, you don't just know people within the church, but you know people outside of the church. So you're not like two-faced. You know, you're, you're not one person outside of church, one person in church. 
But it's all about keeping yourself accountable, keeping yourself humble. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not, excuse me, not greedy of filthy lucre. So even just to be a servant, not a ruling and teaching elder in the church, you still have to abide by the same qualifications. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these also first be proved, and let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. So you see here, not only are bishops men, but deacons are men also. Look, even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. So the qualifications of bishop and deacon are identical. It's just that a deacon you know, may not necessarily be wanting to desire that office of a bishop, may, may not want that responsibility um, or to necessarily labor in the word and doctrine as a bishop would. They're just taking care of the physical needs of the church. But you see here that they must be the husbands of one wife. So they are also men who are married with children. Um, sometimes churches will compromise in that area and they say, well, we don't have any uh, female pastors, but we've got female deacons. How does that make sense? Because there's the exact same qualifications. Like, how can, you, how can you take the stance, hey, only men should be bishops, when it says, likewise, the deacons are the same, right? Um, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. So why would you take the bishops, literally, and say they could only be men that are married, but not the deacons, right? The only woman, I think, like I said a couple of sermons before, that should be uh, full-time supported by the church are widows that have met certain qualifications and they're over 60. Now look here in verse 11, it says, Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Now what's interesting here is it's not just the example of the bishop that other bishops are looking for, or not just the example of the man that bishops are looking at to see does this person qualify. So remember, it's about having the house in order, having the children in order, but it's also the testimony of the wife as well. Because a man may meet all the qualifications, quote unquote, but if his wife is not grave, a, a slanderer, not faithful in all things, not sober, then he's not qualified either. Because it's not just about you meeting the qualifications, your wife also needs to meet certain qualifications. And this is what bishops will be looking at to see, hey, is this person qualified to take up the office of a bishop? <clears throat> All right, let's get down. Now, I'll just end um, just this section just to say this. You know, just because somebody doesn't necessarily meet these qualifications doesn't mean they're not a legitimate bishop. Now, the only reason why I think somebody is not a legitimate bishop is if they have not been appointed. You know, it's like me. I, I could walk into my company and say, hey, look, I'm the new CEO, right? <laughs> But if I'm not hired as a CEO, I mean, it doesn't matter, I call myself the CEO, I can call myself CEO Victor, you know, just like some people call themselves pastor so-and-so, that doesn't make them a pastor just because you call yourself pastor. I mean, whether or not you should even take a title or not, I prefer people just calling me Victor. I mean, a lot of people call me pastor or whatever, uh, um, it doesn't really bother me, but um, it's not something that I demand from people because I don't think there's a biblical precedent for people to be demanded to be called by a title. But, um, you know, if they just call themselves that and they just assume the role themselves, I mean, to me, that, that doesn't even make sense. Like, why, why would we get two chapters in the Bible saying, hey, look, this is what you're looking out for to appoint a bishop, to appoint a deacon, when you just can appoint yourself? You know, what, what's the point of saying, hey, this is what, Titus, this is what you look out for. Timothy, this is what you look out for if you're going to appoint somebody when the person being appointed doesn't need to be appointed. They can just decide for themselves. Hey, they meet the qualifications and they're just going to appoint themselves. So to me, it, it, what makes most sense and what I believe the Bible teaches from Titus is that, hey, bishops are ordained, you know, deacons are ordained by existing bishops. It's a top-down uh, appointment. But just like a job, Let's say somebody, you know, there's no, there's, uh, for whatever reason, you get a job that you weren't qualified for. You know, you get a job as an accountant, but because there was nobody else to do the accounts, you didn't have the degree, but they hire you anyway, and you're doing that job. Um, and you, you become the accountant for that company. 
So just because somebody doesn't necessarily meet these qualifications doesn't mean they're not a legitimate office bearer. But what I'll say is they, they, should, they shouldn't have been appointed, but if they were, then they, I think they do have that authority. So let's say somebody who is single, you know, God forbid, or somebody who is you know, married um, <coughs> get, and doesn't have children is appointed as a bishop, I believe that they are still a legitimate bishop. Because I believe these qualifications here are something that we should all be striving for and it's, given, it's giving direction to a bishop to say, this is what you should be looking for. Now, if a bishop doesn't follow this exactly, has different ways of how they might look at these and appoint somebody, I don't think that makes necessarily that appointment illegitimate. Um, I just wouldn't do it if it was me. Like, I wouldn't hire the person, but somebody else might hire the person um, <coughs> if, they, if they believe it's the right choice. They'll, they will be accountable to God. I don't need to uh, make that decision for them. Um, now, what's really important here, I want to sort of uh, show you as well in Titus. As we go through the qualifications of a bishop, what do you, what do you see as being emphasised? the character of the man. It's not emphasizing the doctrine. Now, doctrine is important, don't get me wrong. But I think sometimes in churches that are like ours, that, that have, I believe, the right positions, we know what we believe, we sometimes overemphasize doctrine. Sometimes people in these sorts of circles that know what they believe, they emphasize doctrine to the point where love goes out the window. And when Jesus said, how you'll know my disciples, did he say you'll know them by the doctrine that they believe? No, he said you'll know them because they love one another. You know, my, the, my disciples love one another and by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples because ye have love for one another. So love by far is more important than doctrine, but that doesn't mean doctrine's not important. Don't get me wrong. Doctrine's very important, but... What I'm getting at here is when we look at the qualifications, what is being emphasized and what is more important is the character. If you think about it, it's saying, hey, he's a, he's a family man. He's running his family well. He's got his children in subjection and all sobriety. He's a you know, lover of hospitality. He's sober. He's just. He's great. It's all the character. And then secondly, it says he's holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught. So I'm not saying that Doc, sound doctrine is not important. It's, not, it's important to hold fast the faithful word. But when you think about, hey, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a child of God? Hey, character, love is more important than the things that we believe. Don't ever put your positions above your character. Because I, I, I personally believe um, it's more important the, the sort of person you are, um, not necessarily what you believe. <clears throat> so a, a good thought there. Now going back, I know it was a, a huge segue, but going back to just the house church movement quickly, I'll, I'll just cover these two points because to me that's the foundation for these these uh, these these next points. But um, <laughs> you got to think, you know, if you had multiple elders in a church, you know, I kind of think why not spread them out? You know, like if uh, it's not like there's a it's not like there's just churches everywhere in Australia. You know, if you're going to have a church that has multiple elders, why not split them up and have two churches with, two, with uh, an elder each? Uh, you'd be able to uh, reach more areas with the gospel. You'd have less travel time. We already talked about this, but, you know, can, you, can a church even afford to pay multiple elders? Because it's not just about having a status. You know, if you're going to take on the office of a bishop, it's about getting paid for the work that you do so you can have that as your full-time job. Um, <clears throat> Let's see. Um, well, people see, well, you need, they'll say you need multiple elders for accountability. Um, but like I said, you know, an elder is not just accountable to the other elders in, uh, in the church. He's accountable to the flock as well. And, he's, and, and last of all, he's accountable to God. You know? so, and this is why I don't think necessarily elders should answer to one another in terms of authority because an elder should do what he believes is right regardless if the other elders in the church believe it's the wrong thing to do. And if that means you know, separating and going one way and the other elders going another, then so be it. You should do what is right by God uh, if you believe it's the right thing to do. Um, so I think you know, there doesn't really need to be a hard and fast rule. 
um, liberty among God's people. I don't think there's a clear command in regards to the number of bishops and deacons the church should have. Um, if we followed the New Testament pattern, I mean, we should only really consider hiring deacons once we have thousands and thousands of people. So people don't follow it really to a T. So we're just given some principles. Um, we see in Acts that, you know, there were 3,000 souls added um, after the day of Pentecost. So do we only get deacons once we have thousands and thousands of people? Well, not necessarily so. So, <coughs> so I think, you know, the amount of elders there are, the amount of deacons there are, it, it should just be in response to the needs and abilities of the church. I mean, because maybe you have, you know, only one person wanting the desire of an office of a bishop, but you may have multiple men that are qualified but just want to serve. So you may have a balance where there's more deacons and, and one person that's just overseeing. Whereas in some churches, you may have more elders than you have deacons. Because, I mean, it depends on the people. You can't just force a rule and just hire people just for the sake of hiring them. Uh, you, you are <coughs> responding to the needs of the church. So this idea that every church must have multiple elders, to me, I think is just a rule that's been created and not one that is clearly taught in the Bible. The last thing I want to talk about is just this idea where people say, you know, in the house church movement, they'll say, hey, you should stay in houses and not have a building. Um, you know, it's funny because even when I started this church, I got an email from somebody and they were asking me, they're, they're saying, are you a house church? Are you, a, are you a church that has a building? And you know what my first thought was? Is, well, we're not meeting outdoors. We're not meeting in a park. You know, why don't you consider the house that we're meeting in a building? Because if you really want to get, you know, quite specific, I mean, a house is a building. So it's just, so, so, what make, so then I think, well, what makes it a house church? Is it a house church just because one person owns the property? So if you own it, then it's a house church. But if you're renting it, it's not a house church. But then I rent my house. So is it a building church now, not a house church? Um, is it only a house church if the bishop pays the whole rent? So only if I pay the whole rent, then it's a house church. But if I don't, if people put in to pay for the rent, then now it's a building church. It's not a house church. Um, is it only a house church if somebody lives there? So if, so if I rent a basketball stadium, but I live there, that's a house church. That's not a, that's not a building church, because I live there, that's my home. You're meeting in my home, but if I live somewhere else, apart from the hall, that's a building church. You should be, a house, you should be in a house. Um, and, and think about this. I said, are we still a house church if we meet in a separated garage space? Because like, you know my house, for those of you who have seen it, the garage is separated. If we met for church there, is that still a house church because it's on the house property? Or is that a building church now because it's a separate building from the house I actually live in? And for those of you who know, I mean, the, the, the garage, it's about a street away, right? So, so what if the building we met in was on the other side of the street instead of the same side of the street? That's a building church, even though maybe the garage is just as far away. You know, these people that live in, that, that have these house churches, sometimes they're just meeting in their backyard barn or whatever in, the, in their garage. And that could be further away than somebody that lives right next door to the building. But they've got a building, they're a building church, they're not a house church. So how far, how far away can your hall be until it's not a house church anymore? You know, it's, not, it's, it's, it's a building church. So this idea that it's like, oh, you know, you're a house church or you're a building church. Well, if you're meeting in some sort of building, you have a building. It's just what, what arrangement you might have, where you live, how you pay for it and things like that. Um, so I think it's quite a silly question. Um, you know, if the, house, if the house is not big enough for the church size, what, what do you do then? You know, like, do you, do you just split off? Because what they'll say is, if you outgrow your house, then you should just start another Bible study. So they don't say, well, you don't take into account, well, do you have somebody even to pastor that church? Is anybody qualified? They just think, oh, you know, you should just split it up just so you can stay in houses. You know, to me, that's just like an arbitrary rule of, you know, well, how, you know why, do you have to stay, why do you have to stay in a small building? So, so if the buildings in the area, the homes in the area that you live in can only hold 10 people, then your church can only be a maximum of 10 people because you're not allowed to hire a separate hall to hold more people. And you know what happens? Usually it's like Americans that have this doctrine 
because Americans, you know, they live in these humongous houses because, you know, American houses are really cheap. They live in these humongous houses with humongous properties and they're like, yeah, let's have a house church. Everyone should be in a house. Yeah, because their houses are like the size of this church property. Yeah, sure, they, they can have a church in there as long as they want. But, you know, try, try, try start a house church movement in like Singapore or Hong Kong where people are living in like studios and one bedroom apartments and tell them that you shouldn't you know, rent a building in order to get a bigger space for a group. So then you split the church to sustain smaller buildings. What if there's no bishop for the new church? Why seek to plant churches without elders? <coughs> um, <coughs> you know, why is it okay for the church in Jerusalem to be thousands of people um, before they split off? And the word of God is multiplying. You've got to sort of think, you know, did God allow them to be split up by persecution because they were big or because they were not going into all the world? So you might say, well, you know, they were really big, but God split them up with persecution because he didn't want them to be big. Maybe, um, or maybe they weren't going. That's the problem. You know, maybe they weren't going into all the world and preaching the gospel. They were all congregating at Jerusalem and God wanted churches in every city and, and, and the gospel to get out there. And that's why he allowed persecution. So how you interpret the story might change your view there. So, you know, even in Sydney, you know, Sydney homes are not really that big unless you're some millionaire. So sometimes you have to rent a building. And, and really the problem that we came across is uh, the council found out about us. And, you know, if we had stayed in that building and just said, you know what, to hell with the council, we'll just keep meeting in a home, they were going to fine us $6,000. So, hey, you know what, you guys want to pay a $6,000 fine, we can stay in the building, you know, I can go to jail for it. Um, I'm not, I'm, I, I don't necessarily think it's worth, you know, you've got to try, sort of pick your battles. So I don't think it's worth throwing $6,000 down the drain. You know, if they take it to court and sue you and all that stuff. They're saying it can be a maximum of $110,000. You kind of just think, you know, how are we going to use our resources? Are we going to use our resources to just fight to, to try and keep a church in a house? Or maybe, maybe we'll just rent a place. But I think we've, we've gone a pretty good place here. I prefer the back hall. Uh, it's a bit nice, a bit more convenient, but um, hopefully it makes it easier as, uh, as we grow and get uh, bigger, hopefully. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. So hopefully that gave you a bit of insight into the topics surrounding the house church movement um, and you learn some things along the way. Um, let's pray. We'll sing a song and then we'll go into the back hall and we'll send the guys to go pick up uh, the chicken so we can have something to eat. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, I just pray, Lord, that um, you bless your people, bless the food, and uh, bless the fellowship. And we love you, Lord, and pray that you'll continue to use this group and just give us wisdom, Lord, as we seek to um, change the world that we live in. And pray, Lord, that we'll see many people saved through our soul winning efforts and pray, Lord, that you would um, help us and just keep us consistent and help us to continue to do the work till you return. We pray. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> All right, let's uh, just sing. I stand amazed. Here we go.